Hi, thanks for joining us today. If this ministry has impacted your life, we want to hear about it. You can send us your story at amen at vnchurch.com. Also, we would love if you would partner with us financially. You can go to vnchurch.com and click the Give Online or text your donation amount to 757-230-2110. To honor copyright laws, we have removed some audio and video elements from this message. Now here's this week's message. Are you ready to increase your joy, build trust, strengthen your relationship with God? Now is the time. Reach your goals. Press on and get spiritually fit. Hitting the faith gym. Well, good morning. How are you today? Welcome online. We're glad that you're with us, whether you're in your car or home or maybe you're working. We're glad that you're able to join with us, either live or afterwards. Um, we are in a series, and we're concluding that today here on Palm Sunday weekend with hitting the faith gym, about growing our faith, about stepping into something larger, understanding our freedoms in Christ, what that means and how we can grow, and with that comes a lot of joy. Now, it seems like uh, every few months, I mean, uh, at least once a month, maybe even more, uh, twice a month, uh, somebody will say, hey, Andy, can I do this and still be a Christian? Can I still be good with God? And, and, uh, and, and they'll say that, well, not really sure. And, and maybe you're wondering that. Maybe you're doing something and a behavior and activity, and you're wondering, I wonder if this is okay. Sometimes that even gets reversed where people say, uh, how can you dare call yourself a Christian and you do such and such? And they try to put bondage on us. They try to put some, you know, like all of these legalistic expectations. And so what we're talking about today is about your freedom in Christ, how you can be strong in Christ. Certainly those are kind of this idea of, of, uh, of growing in your faith or being in the faith gym. So we're going to talk about four workouts, four things that you can do when you're facing that situation of how am I supposed to live out my Christian life? How, what, what's okay to do, what's not? Now certain, certainly there's some things that are clearly specified in Scripture. Hey, you should be doing these things and some things we shouldn't be doing. But you know, there's a lot of, lot of, of gray area. There's this morally neutral uh, turf in, 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 our, in our walk. And so we have to kind of figure out how do we navigate that? How do we do that? And we're gonna talk about that real briefly today. I wanna begin with just, I love this, this verse here you know, at the top of your outline. Uh, notice with me, it's, 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 a, it's a good faith, Jim. Uh, work, uh, uh, workout verse. It says, keep it up. Better yet, redouble your efforts, right? He's, he says, be energetic in your life of salvation, reverent and sensitive before God. That energy is God's energy and energy deep within you. So when we go into these four workouts, it's God's energy that's at work in us. We're going to uh, implement this and grow and become stronger in our faith. Okay, the first workout is the improvement workout. The improvement workout and that's the workout that says, you ask yourself, is this really helping me? <laughs> is this going to benefit me? Am I going to grow and become uh, more like the person God wants me to? How is this going to affect my life? Now, notice what he says there. And Paul's talking in 1 Corinthians 6. He says, everything is permissible for me, but not everything is beneficial. Everything is permissible, but I will not be mastered by anything. So the very first question we kind of come from this verse is, is will this make me a better person? If, if I do this particular uh, uh, thing or event or do I do this habit, or will it make me better? And he says here, uh, we must become like a mature person growing until we become like Christ and have his perfection. So here he clearly says there's some things that are, that are going to be destructive to us and some things that will be constructive, some things that will be helpful, some things will be hurtful. Some things are not, ne are not necessarily wrong, but they're not, even, they're not really necessary. You know, sometimes for us, the enemy of the best is just the good. So often we'll settle for, hey, this is okay, this is good, this is, I can you know, spend time doing this, and it's not 
necessarily wrong, but is it necessary? Is it really benefiting you? And this would be a serious question for somebody who wants to grow in their faith. Hey, is this benefiting you? Or am I just frittering away my time? Am I just throwing it away and wasting? And sometimes we can just be, I think Christians can fall into this because we're thinking, well, I don't, I don't go out and get drunk anymore and I don't party until I'm wasted and I don't do all these. So, but I guess if I just veg in front of the TV for hours upon hours, that's okay. No, that's not necessarily okay. Is that really what's best for you? Or are you just settling? Are you saying, well, I'm not, I'm not doing all that stuff anymore. Well, I'm thankful for that. But, you know, that doesn't necessarily, when we run it through the grid, is this what's best for me? It doesn't, it doesn't really, doesn't, it doesn't work. Number two is, is do I have a, does this what, a thing that I'm doing, does it have a tendency to, to control me or do I control it? You know, some things, they have, their, they have the way to kind of like, it's, it's not necessarily wrong, but the way it's affecting us is. And it starts to get the best of us. And all we do is think about it and think about when we can do it again. And, and, uh, and, and it starts to control us. And the Bible says that anything that controls us is a God in our life. Small g. It's a God. It says, you shall have no other gods before me. Certainly that's one of the commandments, right? No, God says, make sure you don't get this thing out of balance. We're something that is morally neutral. Is, yeah, I guess it's okay. Other people are doing it. But for you, it's, it's, it's not helpful. It's, it's getting the best of you. And it's controlling you. It's becoming a God. So that's something you got to be cautious about. So that's the first workout is this workout of improvement. Number two is, is the workout of integrity. We see this in 1 Peter 2, this idea of integrity. In other words, there's this element of my conscience. It doesn't bother my conscience. And if it does, I need to respond to that. 1 Peter 2.16 says, live as free men, of course, free men and women, uh, but don't use your freedom as a cover-up for evil. So circle that word, cover-up. As a cover-up for evil, Instead, what? Live as servants of God. So he's talking here about when we get a guilty conscience, we tend to want to cover that up because we don't like the feeling that comes with a guilty conscience. Adam and Eve, good example. Adam sins. And the very first thing, if you know that story, the very first thing he does is what does he do? He hides. Who is he hiding from? He's hiding from God. You know, like that's going to be successful. God comes down, comes down to him. He says, hey, Adam, what's up? Well, you know, and he's, he kind of catches him. But he's hiding because he has a guilty conscience. This is, this is what we do. When we get a guilty conscience, we want to cover it up. We don't want to own up. We want to cover up. Yet Proverbs 28, 13 says, he who covers up his sin cannot prosper. It cannot. In other words, when we cover up, we're just, we're just hurting ourselves, right? We can be hurting others, but certainly we're hurting ourselves. And then we try to do things to, to uh, part of the way we cover it up is we rationalize it. We try to convince ourselves it wasn't, it wasn't that bad. And so that's what rationalization is, is we keep telling ourselves something intellectually that it's okay, but down in our heart we know it's not. We're, we're, and we're, we're, we have this, this fight going on internally. We know it's wrong, but we keep telling ourselves, ah, it's not that bad. I mean, you know, think of what I could be doing. What, look at what other people are doing. We just, on and on. We're looking for ways to make ourselves feel better. We're covering it up. <laughs> it's interesting. When Satan is tempting us to sin, he comes up and he'll say to us, if you do such and such, he'll say, no one will ever know. And then we buy into that. Yeah, you know what? I'm all alone. Nobody's going to know. And the minute we do whatever we get tempted to do, he, the, the very next thing Satan says is, somebody's going to find out. I mean, Satan loves to harass us, right? He's always, you know, and we, we buy into it, and then all of a sudden, wait a minute, you, aren't you the same person who told me nobody to know? Yeah, he is. So you don't, the devil's a liar. You don't want to trust him. But this is the way temptation works, and this is the way cover-up works. When we cover it up, oh, well, you know what? Now somebody might know. Now I got to go into the darkness, got to hide. And what that does is, is it sabotages our freedom. God wants us to experience freedom and the joy that we have in Christ, walking free in Christ. But that goes away when we, when we get ashamed, when we don't listen to our conscience. 
So if you're not sure, when it comes to our conscience, if you're not sure, really, the, just the lesson as we looked at that last week is don't do it because whatever you do that's not in faith is sin, the Bible says. So we need to make sure that, that hey, I got to be good with it. Because even if it's other people are doing it, even if it's morally neutral, this area that's, you know, okay, if, if it's not okay with you, you, you shouldn't be doing it. Just give it some time. Put it away for a while. Now, God gives us this conscience, the ability to say, you know, this is wrong. And the Bible says that when we, when we do wrong, when we, w see, God gives us the freedom to cho choose, but we also get the freedom to choose to do wrong. And so when we feel wrong, when our conscience says, ah, oh, you shouldn't do that. And we go, nah, you know what, I'm going to override you. I'm doing it anyways. When we do that, then the Bible says our conscience gets a little more hard, a little more jaded a little less sensitive, a little less tender. In fact, the actual word the Bible uses is our conscience gets seared when we do it continually, continually. And, and so at first, you're, you're in the office and you're thinking, hey, you know what? Uh, things are a little tight. They don't pay me enough around here anyways. I'm going to take some stamps home. Those aren't my stamps. I didn't buy them, but I'm going to take them home. You take the stamps home. The next time, you're thinking, hey, that didn't feel that bad. See, at first there was, there was some conscience with that, but you did it anyways, and now you don't feel bad. You're starting to take stamps, and you're starting to take other supplies home, and, and that's how that works, and you just keep increasing it. But what's happening? Your conscience is getting hard. You're not listening to it, and that's what happens. If you study criminology, they'll say that's what happens with criminals. It didn't start out that way. It starts out with little bitty things, and then we harden our conscience. Now, if you're a believer, the God, God gives you something beyond your conscience. It's the Holy Spirit. When we ask Christ into our life, the Holy Spirit, God's presence, comes in and, and dwells us. He says that our bodies become the temple of the Holy Spirit. And now God's sharing our body with us, communicating to us, guiding us, encouraging us, giving us power and energy like the very first verse we looked at. He's, but at the same time, we can still override God. Even though God is coming to a, align himself with us and help us, he never takes away our free will. We can still say, you know what? I'm going to ignore God. Even though God's speaking to us, he's encouraging us. He's we can say, I don't want that help. I'm going to do what I want. I want to feed my flesh right now. I want to do my own thing. We can always do that. And now, we just don't have a conscience, but we also have something called the conviction of the Holy Spirit that happens. God, the Bible says that God is, is he's, he's saddened for us. And he's, he, he, he longs to have this, us to do what's best for us, which is what God always wants for us. And when we ignore God's voice, when we ignore him, then we have this, this conviction. So now you not only have as a believer, you not only have a guilty conscience, but you have the conviction of the Holy Spirit, but it's all meant to bring us back into right standing with God, to do what's best with our life. And so this is, it's good news because God cares enough about us to reach out to us, to help us. And so this is the workout of integrity. Then there's the workout of influence, of influence. This is about still expressing our freedom, but we're we realize that when we don't live in a vacuum, we don't live isolated. We live in with where what our actions affect other people for good and for bad. And so we have to be careful what we do. Even if we have freedom in Christ to do something, we still have to be concerned about how it affects other people. Let me give you an example. Let's say you're driving along your merry way and then you see somebody who jaywalks right in front of you, right? There's, now, who's got the right of way, you or them? You do, right? That doesn't, just because you have the right of way doesn't mean you can just plow them over, right? You know, just <laughs> boom. Sorry, man, you were jaywalking. I had no crosswalk, no intersection. No, it doesn't work like that, right? You, even though they're in the wrong, you limit your freedom. You're in a hurry, let's say. You have things to do, people to see, places to go. And they're slowing you down. It still doesn't mean you can run them over. You slow down, right? Well, well, I got to slow down. I've got to limit my freedom. I have the freedom to go this fast. Somebody else is in the wrong. I'm going to limit my freedom. This is what Paul's getting at here when he's talking about uh, this in this next passage we're going to be looking at in, uh, in Corinthians. And now, specifically, he's talking about limiting freedom of eating meat. Now, we talked about this last week, right? When Romans 14 
Similar thing, some were vegetarians, some were meat eaters. Here, though, he's talking about people that were eating meat offered to idols. You see, in the ancient town of Corinth, there was two temples, and they would have meat sacrifices to their deities, to their gods, and, uh, then, and there was a lot of that going on, a lot of paganism. So they had a lot of meat. So you had all this meat, supply and demand, you're gonna, it's going to be cheaper. They would then sell it in the temple market, or you could go to the regular market and get a more expensive meat that wasn't offered to idols. And so you had uh, people that were uh, in the church there in Corinth, they were going, you know, I know these idols are just, they're nothing, there's only one God, and, and, and so no big deal, I'm going to save some money and, 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 and buy this, this meat offered to idols. And then they would bring this food into picnics, and they would, you know, share in homes, and they'd invite some friends over, yeah, this meat didn't cost me hardly anything, it was offered to idols. Well, that bothered some people, because some people, you came out of that pagan religion. They used to make offerings uh, and, and eat the meat in devotion to their God, all of a sudden it was, it was hurting them, their conscience. And, so, and in some cases it was causing them to leave the faith and actually get back into paganism. So Paul addresses this issue here when he's talking about limiting your freedom. Do you have freedom to eat that meat? Yeah. But should you always do it? And this is what he drops in and he starts talking about it. Here's we pick it up in verse 9. He says, be careful, however, that the exercise of your freedom does not become what? Yeah, a stumbling block. This is a key phrase, a stumbling block to the weak. So now clearly he's talking about people that are weak in their conscience, weak in their faith, because they might even intellectually know, but they're they're just still struggling in their conscience. And it may fall, cause them to fall into their former lifestyle. So he goes on, verse 10, he says, for if anyone with a weak conscience sees you, who have knowledge, who, who have this knowledge eating in, the, in a temple's, in an idol's temple, won't he be emboldened to eat what has been sacrificed to idols? Now he's talking about the knowledge is, it's just an idol. It's really nothing. It's not, it's not a God. It's, it, I worship the true God. This, this is the knowledge he's talking about. He says, but other people, they're going to see that and it might cause them to stumble. He says, so this weaker brother for whom Christ died is destroyed by your knowledge. So whether they have the knowledge or not, they're, it's, they're, they're getting destroyed. Verse 12, he says, when you sin against your brother in this way and wound their conscience, you sin against who? Yeah, he says you sin against God, you sin against Christ. So he said you're sinning in multiple ways here. He says you sin, when you sin against your brother, he says, first thing, it is a sin, even though it's not for you because you're causing your friend, your brother in Christ or your sister in Christ to stumble and to fall. Now, you've caused them to sin, which now means you've sinned against them. And he goes, you've also sinned against Christ because they're part of the body of Christ. Therefore, he goes on, he says, if what I eat causes my brother to fall into sin, this is a pretty, pretty limiting factor on his, on his freedom. He goes, I will never eat meat again. He's talking about meat offered idols, of course. He says, so, th- so that I will not cause uh, them to stumble. Now, what is he talking about? He's talking about this work out of influence. He goes, I know that my behavior impacts other people. And I am concerned about how it impacts other people. And so much so that I'll limit my behavior. I'll, I'll do things that I don't necessarily want to do. I won't do things that I, necess- that I, that I really want to do. And I do it with this motive because I am concerned about how other people will be, will be impacted on that by that. Now, a lot of people, see, will read this verse, and then they they use this as an excuse for legalism, though. So there's a caution. People today, they'll read that, and they'll go, see? Uh, You you know, and they'll come up with rules and all the things that you can't do. Why? Because they say, well, you, you know, you're offending me. You know, that offends me, so you shouldn't do it. Well, this isn't, we just read that verse. That's not what he said. He didn't say anything about offending, did he? He said, he says, causing them to stumble. But this is what people will say. And listen, you, you'll always offend people. There's, you'll never be exempt from that. Jesus, I mean, that was, that was like one of his side ministries, right? Was offending people. He healed people. You know, he, he encouraged people. He offended people. Especially the Pharisees. He's always offending them. And they're always upset at him. They're, you know, well, why are you healing on the Sabbath? He didn't care what they thought. You know, why are you having friends over that are sinners? And you're all, always at these parties. And there's always alcohol, and you're having so much fun, and we're, we're offended by that, you know. And they were always offended at what things Jesus did. 
And Jesus did not care. Listen, you shouldn't be, we're, you, you're not, I'm, I'm not saying being concerned about offending people. You're always going to offend people. In fact, if you don't offend people, there's probably something wrong. <laughs> right? That, that, that should be a, a good sign. You don't want to offend everybody, but that should be a good sign. If you're offending people, I'm probably doing some, 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 some things right. It says the fear of man brings a snare. You see, if you're always afraid about what people are thinking and worried about offending people, that's, that's, the Bible refers to this as the snare of man, worried about what other people are thinking about you. That is an unwinnable war. And so that's not what he says. He's talking about here, the stumbling block. Not that people have a different opinion about you about something. He says, no, this is not legalism. He's talking about, I don't want to cause people to stumble and fall away. You know, as I, as I was saying, people get offended all the time. You know, people get offended here in our church. They come in and they see maybe the casual dress. And they go, oh, I'm offended by that. You know, you know, you should be dressing up. And does the Bible say you have to dress up? Before? You know, no, the Bible doesn't say that. That's that morally neutral area. This is just the way we express it. Some people do dress up. That's cool. We're not actually saying, we actually don't say you have to be casual. We just say you can be casual. We really want people just to come however they feel comfortable. But we, people get offended because of that. They get offended with our worship. Sometimes we've had people leave because it's too loud. We have people that are not happy because we don't do enough hymns. You know, the, all kinds of reasons people get. We have people that are offended because we believe in female teaching pastors. And that's, that's rare. But that's, we believe that. I, I, God, I actually didn't believe that. I don't know if you know that. For a number of years, because the way I read it, the way a lot of people read the Bible, and I thought this is wrong, and and it offended me when I saw a female pastor preach. And then one day at night, I was studying, and God spoke to me. It was an audible voice. That doesn't happen a whole lot for me, but it was that night. And He said, "Andy, you are wrong on this issue about women in ministry." And I was actually in preparing a message to teach against that. And I just, it was, for me, it was a big deal. It was like a Pauline moment. I had to, wow, what in the world? And I, and I, and I was in seminary at the time, so I studied the Greek and the Hebrew and, and really and just studied that for a number of years, having a whole, coming out with a whole different view. Not just, you know, dumbing it away because that's the way they did it back then. No, I believe that the, the and I, I've written on that, that this is the way God designed it. This is, God's progressive revelation in, in kingdom theology is that women can do all forms of ministry. But not everybody believes that. People get offended with that. And you know what I think? Go to another church. That's fine. That's, that's, uh, that I, I, I'm not worried about you, me offending you. But Paul here is talking about causing people to stumble, causing people to stumble into their old lifestyle. That word uh, stumble is... Uh, proscoma, and it means to, to cause somebody to morally fall, to cause them to fall back into sin. Here's the definition. Stumbling block is any action or word that will cause other Christians to fall back into their former, former lifestyle. It doesn't mean they disagree with you or they don't approve of you. It means that it's causing them to fall back into their former lifestyle. So what do you do if you actually have a stumbling block that you're doing something and it's causing somebody to uh, stumble. Well, what is your response? Well, that's where he talks about limiting our freedom. Out of, we do that because we care about people. So we limit our freedom. Does it mean you completely give it up? You can never do it again? No, this is not what he says. He just says you limit your freedom when you're with that person, when you're with that group. If they're weak, you Limit your freedom so that you don't offend those who have a weak conscience. You don't, not just offend, but you know what I'm saying. You cause them to fall back. Here's what he says. He says, and he talks about his freedom and how he limits himself. 1 Corinthians 9, verses, beginning of verse 1 and, and some of those verses there in that chapter. He says, am I not free? And then he goes on to list them as freedoms. He says, don't I have the right to food and drink? Don't I have the right to have a wife? Paul was single. And he goes, I have that right if I want. And he goes on in verse 12, listening, listing some freedoms for him and Barnabas. He says, if others have this right of support from you, shouldn't I have the right all the more 
but we did not use this right. So here he says, I had the right to do all that, but I, I didn't. I limited myself for the sake of other people. And then drop down to verse 19. Though I am free and I belong to no man, I make myself a slave to everyone. Why? To win as many as possible. To the Jews, I became a Jew to win the Jews. He says, when I'm around Jews, I eat kosher. I don't order a big slab of pork. No, he goes, no, I'm, I'm, I'm not, I don't want to do that. He goes, to those under the law, I became like one under the law, though I myself am not under the law. So it's to win those under the law. To those who, to those not having the law, I became like one not having the law, though I am not free from God's law, but am under Christ's law. So as to win those not having the law. To the weak, I became like the weak to win the weak. I became all things to all men so that by all possible means I might have, I might save some. I do all of this for the sake of the gospel that I might share in its blessings. So he says, I have the right to do these things, but I don't. I don't because I care about other people. And so I limit myself. I don't do it. So I'll do it with them, when I'm with them, and then I won't do it when I'm with these people. You go, wow, that sounds, <laughs> you know, that sounds like he's two-faced. You know, that sounds like he's got, you know, he's like a hypocrite. He's got issues there. Well, this is, he's not saying he doesn't do those. He just doesn't do them in certain circumstances. He just says, no, I, I do do that. I have that freedom. I just limit my freedom when I'm there. See, this is different. Why? Because he cares about them. In other words, he goes over to somebody's house to visit them, and they're an ex-alcoholic. He, he has some iced tea. He doesn't need to have a beer. No, he, he limits himself. And, and this is something we need to be thinking about with other people. I mean, if you have people over to your house, some people go, hey, it's my house, I'll do what I want. I drink beer, and so I'm drinking beer. I don't care who's here. Well, that's, not, that, that's certainly not what Paul would do. He would say, no, I'm going to limit myself. You know, if, if I have people, that, that would cause them to, you know, stumble. People sometimes they'll <coughs> have a group of friends over and they'll watch a movie that really is not a very good movie. I mean, in other words, you, there's a bunch of, and that's more and more most of the movies now, but, you know, have sexual images, ex explicit sexual images, stuff that's really not edifying to your soul. And then we don't really care. It's my house, right? Or we, you go to a movie. What do you do when you're in a, in a movie theater? You've paid money, and you're there. Well, sometimes I've gotten up and left. Sometimes I just close my eyes. You know, the Bible says that I have made a covenant with my eyes that I might, that I might not sin against you. You know, everything that comes in through your eyes is, is, is not necessarily neutral. We can let stuff in our eyes that hurt us, that damage our souls. And you know that because you think about it later. And then you think about it over and over. How did that happen? There's something that went in. There's something that fired and triggered. I won't watch things like Game of Thrones or these, these, these TV series or really a lot of movies. I'll wait till they come out and I can control it with my, with my remote or some way I can fast forward. Through. I don't watch Game of Thrones live. I would never do that because it's filled with crap that I have no business watching, nor would I want anybody else to see. So I do not do that. And that means, hey, Andy, that means you can't hashtag and tweet and be, you know, and, and, and be in with everybody. That's true. I give that up. That means somebody could, like, give a spoiler alert. and you. Find, yep, that's true. I give that up. Yep, so there's some entertainment. I limit myself because it's bad for me, but also I'm careful about how I impact other people. Say, what was all that about? I don't know. I just thought I'd throw it in. <laughs> when I want to say something, I work it in. You know, it doesn't, have, it doesn't always fit. So here he says, and I love this in chapter 10 because he, he, he explains it even more. He says, everything is permissible. He kind of said that earlier, remember? He said, but not everything is beneficial. Everything is permissible, but everything's not constructive. Then he says, nobody should seek his own good, but the good of others. And then verse 25, eat anything, sold, uh, eat anything sold in the meat market without raising questions of conscience, for the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. So he says, hey, you, you know there's no difference between it, and you have that freedom to express your faith there, 
He goes, why? Because, you know, it's all this, all this, uh, it's all from God. And so he says, just be careful of, you know, what you're doing in front of different people. But if you're alone or you're with people that you know, it's okay with, don't worry about it. In other words, if you sit down and you've got uh, a, a, some pork on your plate, you don't have to pull out your phone and go to my VC and start calling everybody in the, in, the, in the contacts there. You don't have to go to your small group contacts list in your phone and call everybody and say, hey, I'm about to eat a piece of pork. Is that going to hurt you? Is that going to bother you? No, right? He says in your privacy, if you're around people you know, that, that's okay. Don't worry about it. And he says, but if anyone says to you, this has been offered in sacrifice, do not eat it, both for the sake of the man who told you and for conscience sake. The other man's conscience, not yours. And then this is a key phrase here. He says, for why should my freedom be judged by another's conscience? He says, hey, listen, you, can, you have freedom. Express your freedom, but don't flaunt it. Right? He says, express your freedom. So there's the, this is the context. If we're going to grow in our faith, if we're going to grow in this area of the workout of influence, we need to realize, hey, I get to express a lot of, my, of, of the freedom I have in Christ but I need to be careful about who is around it, who's around when I'm doing things, okay? Now, <clears throat> the last workout routine. Paul says, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. See, I love this phrase, the yoke of slavery. He says, that's what legalism is. If you, it's just a yoke. It's, it's not... It's, it's, a, it's a spiritual slavery. It's a spiritual, it's, 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 a, it's a legitimate form of slavery. Because that's just a yoke you don't want on you. And, and so he says, be careful about that. And, and, this, and he talks about this workout of love. In other words, it's, is it, the question is, is it the loving thing to do? I don't want to fall into legalism, this spiritual slavery. I, I want to do what's loving. And so he says, here he says, you, my brothers, were called to be free. But do not use your freedom to indulge the sinful nature. Rather, serve one another in love. The entire law is summed up in a single command. Love your neighbor as yourself. He says, use your freedom not to indulge your selfishness or your, your, your sinful nature. Your, he goes, use your freedom to serve others. It's not what am I freed from, but what am I freed for? How can I use my time and my energy more to, pers to, to encourage others in a loving way. Here's a verse, look on the, this, the, uh, it's not on your outline, but it's on the, the, the side screens. It says, it's out of Jude. It says, they are godless men who change the grace of our God into a license for immorality, saying that God's forgiveness allows us to live immoral lives. In other words, he's saying, some people, they, they're not legalists, they, they, they operate like, I can do anything I want. It doesn't even matter if God has said, don't do it. I can do anything I want. And he says, well, when you go that far over, now you're into this license of immorality. Because where you're just saying, well, I'll do whatever I want. And why? Well, because God will forgive me. Well, listen, a forgiven life is a life that's willing to change. That's always demonstrated. When somebody understands that they're forgiven by God's grace, the response always is, I want to change to become more like God. I thank you. And it's a response. When somebody gives you, when somebody, if, if you, somebody lays their life down for you and you find out about it, I mean, your response is, well, I should probably go to the funeral, right? I should probably, I need to do something, maybe send a gift. Somebody did something amazing for me. When, when God sent his son, Jesus Christ, and he died for you, and he set you free and gave you grace and empowered you with his spirit, that our, our response is, I want to I respond in a loving way. Picture like a large river, and you have like two banks on either side of the river. On one side would be legalism. You have to do this. You have to do that. Rule upon rule, all these traditions, and there's plenty of, of, of churches, there's plenty of religions that are filled on that side of the bank. These are all the rules you've got to do to try to earn God's favor, and we can never meet that. There's never enough rule. I mean, we're always comparing ourselves, wondering, is it enough? And the answer is it's not, according to Scripture. Then on the other side of the bank is people that have just given up on that, and they just say, I'm just going to live however I want. I don't care what God says about it. And I'm just going to live with this license 
to do whatever I want. Both of those are extremes. Paul is saying in the scriptures we read today, he says, don't get on either one of those. Both of them are equally as bad, equally faulty. We need to stay in the center, the stream called love. So not legalism, not license, but love, where we're saying always, what is the loving thing to do? How can I, how can I express my faith and grow in my faith in a way that, that uh, uh, answers the question, am I improving? Am I becoming a better person? Am I, is this constructive for me and helpful for me? Is this the best thing for me? And then this part of, inf- uh, of, uh, of integrity. You know, how am I, am I ignoring my conscience? Is there some things that you are doing that you know, you're, you're just not sure actually, or you know you're, you, shouldn't, you shouldn't be doing them. Now listen, if in doubt, don't. The Bible says if you can't do it in faith, it is sin. It is wrong for you. Maybe it'll be better, okay, later on. If it's in that morally neutral area. Some things you just, you just, have you seared your conscience? Are you allowing the Holy Spirit to speak to you? Because he will. You say, God, I want to do the, what's best for me and my integrity and my improvement, but also how I influence others. It's not okay to just do whatever you want and say, well, my kids are old enough. They, should, they'll have to, they have to live their own life. It doesn't really matter how my life impacts them. It does matter, according to God. It does matter how you live your life and how it impacts your spouse. It does matter how you live your life and it impacts your community that you live in. Paul says, I'll do whatever it takes. I mean, I, I'll eat kosher for the rest of my life, if that's what it means to reach some for Jesus. He says, I'll, I'll limit myself in all kinds of ways. And that's the loving response. That's when we step into this last workout of love saying, that's really the great question, right? Is this the most loving way I can respond? The truth is, our actions have consequences. We've got to be aware of that. One of my favorite theologians said this. He said, your choices, you, you can't, you, you, he says, you live by the consequences of your choices. Samuel Mead. <laughs> it's true. It's absolutely true. We do live by that. Let's bow our heads and pray. Heavenly Father, I just thank you, Lord, for your your grace and your forgiveness. We could just bask in that. What an amazing God we serve. You call us down off this bank of legalism of trying to uphold certain moral codes to get your good favor, which will never happen. Because your favor comes through grace. I thank you for sending your son, Jesus Christ, dying on the cross, rising from the dead, extending your grace to everyone who calls upon the name of Christ. If you have never put your faith in Christ, this is the greatest action of love you will ever do. And it's a response to God's love to you. Will you just say, God, thank you for loving me enough to send Jesus Christ. You go, Andy, how do I do that? Will you do that in prayer? And I'm gonna invite you to do that with me right now. Would you just say, today I receive the work of Christ, what he did on the cross. Just do that right now where you're at. You say, God, today I want to receive the work of Christ into my life. Birth something new in me. You say, God, help me to be freed from the the shackles of legalism, spiritual slavery. 
that will keep me in guilt, to keep me without joy. If you say, God, give me the strength to not veer over to the side of the license and taking advantage of your grace, taking advantage of your forgiveness, that certainly is not the mark of a forgiven person. If you say, God, help me to steer down in this wide bank of love, always looking for the loving response. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for tuning in to today's message. If God is impacting your life through this ministry, join us in reaching others by investing today. You can give by texting your donation amount to 757-230-2110 or by going to vineyardchurch.com slash give. Also, don't forget to subscribe to our channel so that you never miss an update. We'll see you next week.